is Zach Simke, and I'm director of Passive House Accelerator. We're very excited about today's episode. Passive House Accelerator is a um, place for information sharing um, about passive house design and high performance building. Um, we're a, we welcome all comers to our exploration of how to slash the greenhouse gas emissions from our buildings and make them more resilient to the wild weather, the extreme temperatures, and the grid insecurity caused by climate change. And retrofits are extremely key to that work. And so we're particularly excited about today's episode focused on waterproof, breathable fabrics in low carbon interfits at scale and featuring guests, Andrew Simmons and Tim. I wanna first say thank you to um, Hugh Wariski and Yulia Potor for co-creating this uh, series with the Passive House Accelerator. And I just wanted to give a, a moment for Yulia to say hello. Hello, and thank you to everybody for joining us for the third episode. I just want to say that this session will cover innovative approaches and some of the best practices for scalable retro retrofitting to energyfit uh, standards. So stay tuned to learn more about it and address your questions. Thank you. Um, with that, I want to hand it off to our co-hosts. We have today Dara McGowan of uh, Partel um, and Mike Jacob of Kiss House and Ben Adam Smith of house planning help. So Dara, Mike, and Ben, please take it away. Thanks, Zach. So yeah, my name is Dara McGowan. I'm a technical consultant here in Partel. Uh, we supply products for low energy buildings, both for new build and, and retrofit. So I was lucky enough to get to visit the project we're going to look at today a couple of months ago. And it was really exciting to see a different approach to retrofit. So I'm really looking forward to today's presentation to see the progress that they've made uh, since my last site visit. Thanks, Dara. My name is Mike Jacob. I'm a co-founder of Kiss House. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I think we're in for a treat. I get the impression there's an awful lot of thinking and a lot of data and a lot of information that's going to be shown to, shown to us and shared with us today. I'm really excited about that. Thanks. And I'm Ben Adam Smith from House Planning Help, and I have the honour of introducing our guest today. I will, just before I do this, say a big thank you to the AECB, who I'm sure we're going to hear a lot more about. But when I entered the world of construction about 10 years ago, I was very lucky that early on someone said, oh, you know, I hear what you're interested in. You should really go and check out the AECB. And it has been a cornerstone organization to the knowledge that I have learned. So Andy Simmons is an architectural designer and partner in Simmons Mills Architects, as well as chief executive of the AECB that I've already mentioned, the Association for Environment Conscious Building. His architectural and building experience covers historic and contemporary buildings, innovative and traditional materials, and the development of built environment energy efficiency solutions. Andy has led the development of the AECB energy standards and initiated the AECB Carbon Light Program. This makes him an expert on best practice in moisture robust energy efficiency retrofitting of different types of UK buildings. And that also includes one of his own that he did probably some time ago. I'm sure he'll tell us about Grove Cottage. Tim Hulse is a Passive House champion and director at Ecovert Solutions, a UK based company. As a chartered engineer and certified um, and certified Passive House designer, Tim has a keen focus on sustainability and energy efficiency, being a passionate supporter of high performance building. He's been involved in many low energy projects with a detailed knowledge of building physics, focus on the latest sustainable materials, quality and reduced energy consumption. Take it away, guys. Okay, over to me, is it? Did you not like your introduction? <laughs> I loved it. It's just I thought that <laughs> Well, Zach it's your turn to, now. <laughs> I thought Zach was going to do this first slide, but that's fine. No problem. Okay, so um, we're going to cover 
quite a lot of aspects of things and there is a danger that you're going to see some intriguing numbers and detail which we just don't have time to to, to get into um, the plan is that after I've done this presentation we and when we get some more monitoring data to substantiate what we're saying we're going to run another webinar where we can spend an hour going into more detail and also at that point I would be happy to share this uh, PowerPoint um, so forgive me if it appears we're sort of perhaps rushing over some things that you might want to ideally dig into so um, yeah so this is one of this is one retrofit project of several um, in the <clears throat> able to pay private sector um, and it's for a 1950s house detached house uh, near, near Monmouth in, in the UK um, we've been working on it for the last 18 months in terms of uh, design um, and then Tim has been managing the build uh, for what seems like a quite a long period of time but that has been affected by Covid and Brexit which has, has added uh, joy to, to all of us really. Um, what, what we're trying to, to do is work in a slightly different way at the moment we're calling it the better building model um sounds rather grand but we're just trying out a slightly different arrangement so while Simmons Mills do the um the the architecture um in this case it's not just a straight retrofit <clears throat> it's a rebuilding of an extension uh, a substandard extension on the end there you see had to be knocked down um and also quite a lot of remodeling internally and a lot of rejigging of windows um so whilst we do the the, the design working with the client we're, we've moved to working with Tim much more closely to tighten up the specification um, based on getting better feedback from products that have worked well and that him and his team are happy to use. But importantly, rather than going to a QS, we've actually worked together to produce a cost plan, open book, so we can um, <clears throat> be very honest and open with the client. Um, and rather than building in overheads um, builders overheads and profit we've taken that out and, and tried to sort of present that as a as a project management cost um, which Tim will probably want to comment on in a, in a minute and as part of that cost planning we we allow for one iteration of value engineering um, obviously cost obviously tend to come in usually beyond what the client was expecting so to have an open book value engineering process um, not only produces more resource efficient designs but also uh, helps the client understand and also potentially reduce their expectations and, and the budget and then the project and site management um, as I said is something that we've we've we sort of asked Tim to, to price for as a separate service and a separate contract for for the client. Tim do you want to say something about how you found that process whether it's it, you think it's, it's, it's working for you? Uh, well it, the, the that process went pretty smoothly. I mean, it, I enjoyed working sort of interactively with Andy during the design stages where um, he'd be using SketchUp or something on a screen and we'd walk through potential options for the for the design and then he'd draw it and I'd say, well, how are you going to build that? Or, you know, we'd, we'd comment on different things and try and figure out how to, how to, to do it in a way that was it's going to be easily explainable to another builder and easily built because the whole idea here was to take somebody who hadn't built a passive house before and get them to the point where they could actually deliver a passive house um, although we're not getting to, to you know certify a benefit standard on this this job but that, that was the objective so the interesting thing for me was to, how we could tighten up that whole process streamline it so that we could pre present it as a package to people who might be interested in actually doing the work and then use that to guide them through the through the build process yes yeah there are there are other interesting conversations around what we're trying to do there but i don't think we've got time to do it unfortunately um so if i move on I was particularly interested in this this project because 
We are thinking of getting much more involved in retrofit. We've obviously been focusing on it for a few years, but it is so hugely important and and hugely challenging. Every building is different. Um, we have uh, not only uh, energy issues to deal with, reducing the energy we use in buildings, but also embodied carbon issues. And there is a, a real need just to sort of really start exploring and uh, but exploring in a in a in a in a rigorous way. So you know we do PHPP to look at the energy performance of the building before and after retrofit. But also we're using um, uh, PH ribbon to do lifetime carbon calculations. So we can start to make intelligent decisions about whether we use this material or that material. Uh, looking carefully at trade-offs with operational energy versus upfront carbon emissions from products. So. One of the reasons that we ended up so enjoying this as a technical challenge is because we're looking, how do we use um, low cost, easily available uh, timber based products used very efficiently in very small quantities to achieve very good U value. So for example, the walls in this construction, uh, as you see, are very, very fat. The external wall insulation system is very fat achieving a value of about 0.1 um, through using recycled cellulose insulation, very small section timber, wood fibre balls and so on. So at a technical level and a sort of reduced embodied carbon level, it's a very satisfying project. Uh, and the client was also particularly interested in this. Not only did he want a very low energy building, he wanted to explore innovation, but meaningful innovation, not novelty. So we found ourselves aligned on that. The standard that we were aiming for on this project was initially um, suggested by the client as ENFIT, so the Passive House standard for existing buildings. And we said, fine, you know, no reason we can't achieve that. And, uh, and, and that was the, the, initial, the initial target. So all the measures that were applying to this, this building were designed to achieve ENFIT. But we did have a separate conversation, which was that uh, uh, an equally meaningful standard for the UK for existing buildings is the AECB retrofit standard. So that's the Association for Environment Conscious Building. And um, it's slightly less demanding. Um, we also think that it's, it's, it's uh, perhaps more replicable across all the different types of, of, of buildings in the UK, particularly housing. Um, and we said, let's use the AECB standard as a backstop. So at the moment, uh, the Passive House Planning Package, PHPP, shows that the measures we're applying here pretty much deliver benefit in terms of the, the thermal performance. It's hovering around the target number for space heating demand. Um, what we're less sure about is the air tightness target. So what we've done is use the ACB standard target, which is two, two air changes per hour, 50 pascals, uh, as our backstop. And that's what we're looking at today. Where are we? Have we achieved the backstop? And in fact, can we improve it? Maybe even to get one, which is of course the benefit target. Andy Simmons came to me with the, a client who was interested in doing something with it in a really low carbon way. And I've done a number of projects with Andy in the past. Um, we've done a certified passive, well, two certified passive houses and a retrofit. And um, I was really interested in working with Andy again but what we were looking to try and do was come up with a system that we could use on multiple projects. And off the back of this one, we've got another two projects that we need to do. Now, all three were going to be pretty similar. We wanted to standardize on a, on a solution that we could take from one to the next and possibly uh, send out into the wider world for other people to, to adopt as well, not, not just something that we would uh, keep our arms around. So I was involved with Andy pretty early on in this project, trying to figure out how we were going to do it. And we agreed that we'd do it in a, in a collaborative way, which, which worked really well using, using SketchUp and Zoom online, sort of designing in real time, trying things out. Uh, Andy would draw something and say, well, what about that? And I'd say, well, how are we gonna build it? Or if we did that, we'd make it easier. So it's really sort of interactive approach. And very early on, we decided that we were gonna uh, approach it by trying to wrap the house from the outside using iJoyce. Um, I'm particularly concerned about the, uh, us using sustainable materials out there. You know, whilst we've used EPS and, and other plastic based insulations in the past, I'd much rather move away from them to more sustainable materials. Um, and stuff based on, on, on wood 
just seems to work really well. Um, we've built a few houses with eye joists and filled them with warm cells, warm cell insulation. So we thought, well, why don't we do take the same approach here? So what we've done is simply wrap the house with eye joists up the outside walls, over the roof, filled that whole space with warm cell, um, which gives you a nice insulated uh, tea cozy effect wrapped wrap, wrap around the house. And then the, the next part of that was trying to think how we're going to finish that on the outside. And typically in a new build, we'd put some wood fiber insulation outside of that to break the thermal bridge through the eye joists and then put membrane outside. But Sandy was concerned about um, uh, bats and, you know, catching the hooks on the, on the membrane. So I suggested putting the wood fiber outside instead of the membrane. Um, which is what we did. It sounded sounded simpler than it was. It's, it's simp simple on paper, but it created some issues in terms of actually getting the warm cell into the into the building. And uh, when, when we came around to the practical side of it, which needs a bit more thinking about uh, next time. But overall, it worked worked really well. I think you know we've we've ended up with a a good solid deep layer of insulation right around the house, wrapped with the the, the membranes and then the wood fibre on the outside. Uh, the interstitial condensation risk is, is right here, right on the cold side of the insulation behind the, um, uh, the membrane. And particularly because there is no specific uh, air vapour check on the inside. So I guess this is what makes it fairly innovative. So in order to assess the risk, we asked Partel to carry out a woofy calculation. Um, looking at the worst case, and we thought maybe the worst case was uh, what might happen to the metal fixings holding on the, um, the wood fibre cladding, because if condensation was forming around those nails in cold winters and creating little rock pockets, the whole thing could fall off. So we identified a weakness, a sort of weak point, and then assessed that. The, the woofy suggested that we should be fine, particularly because we're using cellulose insulation. We certainly wouldn't try this with a, a mineral fibre or another non-hygroscopic material uh, in, in the wall box there. Um, now, in addition to that, Woofy is fine and it can certainly capture trends and give us a good indication. But we have a, a number of projects similarly trying out different things like this, uh, and we, about 20 projects where we have um, environmental condition um, sensors built into the constructions. So we decided we'd do the same thing thing here. So we have a number of um, uh, sensors on the warm side and the cold side of this construction. We have one inside and one outside the building and we can basically follow it over the next year to see exactly what is going on here. So we'll be measuring relative humidity, temperature and also the moisture content, wood moisture equivalent content, WME, of the critical timber members. So those are in now and we're starting to get readings which is very interesting. One of the really interesting things about the project is that um, we've essentially taken a, a local builder who's never done any of this stuff before and strong-armed them into taking that step up to, to really trying to do something different and there's so much different uh, about this project you know compared with how how people would normally do uh, you know uh, improve their insulation and on, on a new build uh, sorry on an existing house and so on. Um, you know, generally, if you go and have an if you have an extension built or you have some work done on your house, you don't think at all about air tightness. That's that's completely unknown to, to regular builders, and they'll typically put much less insulation on. Um, it's probably just king span dot and dab onto a wall and something like that. So everything about the way that we've done this is completely different. Um, you know, they, we were lucky with the builders here. They've had some experience with timber frame which has really worked out in terms of putting the eye joists on the wall. It's in, in a way, it's just like big timber frame. Um, but it has been a big learning curve for them in terms of trying to um, figure out how to do the air tightness and so on, that we've tried to help them uh, through. Uh, but at the end of the day, you've just got to do it, see what the issues are, and figure out how to deal with it. And the, the, the lads are really engaged with that. They've really got stuck in. Um, they're thinking about how how to do it, where the issues might be, the, you know, asking questions, which is, to me, that's 90% that's of it. If you're thinking and asking questions, you're going to catch most of the issues. And then it's, it's our job to try and point out the more tricky things that people typically wouldn't think about or, you know, would, would gloss over. But the importance of doing it at this stage in the build is that you've got the opportunity now to try and 
correct things. On, on the outside, you know, we're pretty much a bit limited in what we can we can do. Most of the cladding's on the on the building now, so we can't go back and do anything there. But outside, it's relatively straightforward. It's big sheets of membrane taped together, so it's not an awful awful lot to go wrong there, apart from nail penetrations and screw penetrations. Um, but the, 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 for me, the tricky bit really with, with any retrofit is this sort of blend between the new work that you're doing and what's already there, what condition those walls are in. And the, the walls here, I think it's the 60s house, but the construction is, it's not in great shape. The, the, you know, the mortar isn't great. It's got some really poor quality concrete blocks in places and things like that. So it's a very porous structure. So basically, as soon as anything gets to hit that structure, there's a good chance that it's going to be in and around and come out somewhere um, where you're not expecting it. So I think um, if, you know, if we can get sub two on the air test, I think, I think that's good enough, you know, considered, considering that the, the project as a whole isn't trying to get down to passive house levels of, of insulation and everything. We're taking a, a balanced approach and I think sub two on the test is going to be where we, where we need to be. So I'm Gervais Mangrana. I'm the air pressure tester for the project. This is the first time I've visited the site today. And um, we've, uh, we've agreed a three test strategy for this project if it was needed. Um, and initially here, we're effectively testing the external air tightness layer, uh, which is a, a bit of a novel, it's a novel approach on this, on this project. And ultimately, I think the, the ultimate aspiration would be a benefit level one air change target, but with a backstop of an AACB two air change target. And there's still a fair bit of work to do in here. Um, and there was there were some things that needed sealing up, the usual penetrations and so forth. So on our first test, we, we got to around three um, and found a few things that still needed sealing some soil vents and stuff that got missed. So at the moment, we're down to 2.4. Uh, and we're just going through some of the other non-intentional penetrations that have been discovered on those first on that first sort of test and see where we get up to at that point. Feeling engaged and wanting to do more, I just asked the builder here whether he'd do it again and although he's found it difficult and challenging, he, he totally does want to do it again, so that's great to hear. Okay, there's been some interesting chat actually. <laughs> yeah, a lot of very um, uh, sort of socially uh, relevant chat, and I think I will try and tackle some of those or respond to some of those issues as, as we go through, because certainly our focus is on the ethical and social aspects related to. So, although this is a sort of relatively high uh, high budget project, not all of our projects are by any means, and this is a very good test bed. Certainly the client who is an engineer is very interested in, in helping us make this a test bed. And since we started this project, um, we've, we've, we've won a contract to work on a, a social housing programme under a new um, uh, British standard, which has tried to introduce quality into retrofit for social housing. And so obviously a lot of what we're doing here, we're hoping we'll be able to feed into, into that sort of work as well. So. Uh, this kind of touches on it as well. So what is the scale of the challenge? Well, if the challenge is to improve the performance of pretty much all the buildings in the UK, I mean, it's the UK context, um, then the challenge is immense because our buildings are very poorly performing buildings and we spend an awful lot of energy um, keeping them fairly cold in the sense that so much heat leaks out um, and that has health impacts um, and it has greenhouse gas impacts um, and, uh, and, and and as far as we can make out it, it's you know it's a, it's a sensible response to to climate change is to try to do something about it doing something about it is not something we've been very good at because the energy efficiency programs that have been implemented suffer, <clears throat> among other things, from doing too shallow a retrofit, which doesn't help alleviate fuel poverty. It doesn't take much increase in fuel costs to sort of push people back into fuel poverty if you don't do enough, uh, enough deep, uh, sort of enough, you don't make a big enough improvement. Um, there are also sort of uh, unintended consequences to do with poor performance health, particularly indoor air quality can suffer. 
uh, moisture related problems sort of start um, surfacing. Um, and certainly in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, the, the measures just don't, <clears throat> don't deliver what we expect them to. So, so there's a serious issue here. Um, so the way we look at this, I mean, a, a fun fact, if you want, um, UK uh, houses might be described by, by types. Um, the building research establishment has 13 typical buildings. We found it useful to group those into three categories <clears throat> described by the form factor, the sort of proportion of heat loss area to the, uh, the floor area. And uh, the higher the form factor, um, the more difficult, the more challenging it is to to reduce the um, heat loss cost effectively. So you end up having to sort of achieve better U values on high form factor buildings like bungalows. Medium form factor might be a, a typical semi-detached or end terraced house, and a low form factor <clears throat> would be something very compact, so a mid-terraced three-story townhouse would be a good example of that. So from our from the ACB um, domestic stock model, which we've built, we we actually have. A fairly good um, idea of the of, of some sort of key um, characteristics of our building stock. So in England and Wales, for example, there's about two and a half million bungalows, ten and a half million semi-detached houses, and twelve and a half million townhouses. Now, <clears throat> if I got my 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 rush late night sums right, taking the figures from that, um, that's about nine hundred square miles of wall surface that <clears throat> probably needs well almost definitely needs insulating but being realistic uh because of various other constraints maybe a third of those properties might have to be internally insulated because of conservation issues or boundary issues or other complexities maybe one third we won't be able to manage either because they're listed or just because the programs just can't <clears throat> scale up enough even if you were to say a third of those properties um might need some form of external wall insulation that's about 300 square miles of wall <coughs> which we need to you know arguably insulate between now and let's say a, no, a notional 2050 um so that's really starts to make you think so some of the obvious things that jump out of that is that well you know there's no one particular approach we need a variety of approaches we need a, a wide range of ewi systems and they should all be focused on trying to from our modeling um, reduce the space heat demand of the UK stock by about half down to something like 50 kilowatt hours per meter squared in a year. Bearing in mind that Enerfit would be looking at uh, around 20, 25 kilowatt hours. So this is the ACB, we've actually pitched the ACB standard around this. So some projects <clears throat> where the opportunity allows we should go, we, we should do better retrofits and, and the more challenging projects we might do slightly worse. But on balance, on average, if we can get our space heat demand down to about this level, then the uh, forecasts given to us by the national grid as we move, as we uh, decarbonize electricity and move a substantial portion of domestic heating over to electricity, then the, natu the, the, the national grid reckons it can, it can provide that amount of decarbonized electricity for uh, to, to, to cover space heating out to 2050. So it's supply and demand matching. Um, getting a typical UK building down to 50 is still challenging. We need to uh, avoid performance gaps because basically, you know, climate change is a, is a physics issue. Um, we can't have performance gap, it has to perform. And we can't have systems which are vulnerable, uh, particularly to moisture damage or other failures. So they have to, they have to work well. We're definitely going to need um, the materials we use and the processes we use to manufacture and, um, and, 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 and on site to become increasingly decarbonized. There are going to be, uh, supply and demand problems. I mean, we're seeing it with, with, with Brexit and COVID related factors, but obviously as we scale something up, you know, to levels of construction that, that hasn't, we haven't seen for many, many decades, if, if potentially if ever, there are clearly going to be supply and demand problems. Um, and that also applies to skills. So systems need to be fast and relatively easy to understand and so on. Um, and obviously, big picture we need enough material resources to be able to actually carry out programs at this scale uh, a few headline figures about this particular project so it's 175 square meters um, it is currently showing that it should achieve the benefit space heat demand target the air test <clears throat> following gervais's test that you saw in the video there um, we did that at a point where we hadn't completed 
the, for example, the floor to wall internal air tightness taping, we hadn't completed that. Um, so we, on, on, the, on the following test, we perhaps surprisingly found we got down to 0.75 air changes per hour. So actually we have achieved the benefit and, and that's through the, the measures that I'll describe in, in, in the presentation. Um, I've just quickly shown the uh, <clears throat> the losses and gains associated with this house, just because there's always a couple of interesting things in there. So you can see that the windows, which are this yellow block, the losses of 17.8 are about the same as, as the gains, useful solar gains. So on balance, uh, the windows um, don't gain much more than they lose, but um, and vice versa. So it's not a bad not a bad balance. Uh, the the brown there on the left, the 5.1, <clears throat> shows that we've actually reduce heat losses from the floors um, quite well, but we have had to go in quite heavy with that one. We, we, we've dug out the old floors uh, and we have replaced it with a fully insulated new floor. So there's a carbon, um, uh, in, uh, upfront carbon emissions associated with that. One of the things we were trying to ensure happens is the surface temperatures of the um, uh, wall to floor junction are high enough because one of the biggest failures of not treating the floor is where the uh, you get thermal discomfort and uh, people will tend to turn the thermostat up as a result of that. In terms of strategies, so the section on the left shows the house cavity wall construction, which had actually had cavity wall insulation in it. So there's some uh, graphitized gray polystyrene beads in the cavity, uh, but otherwise a pretty basic um, tiled roof construction, <clears throat> solid floors, no insulation apart from the cavity there. And, and I think there's about four inches of insulation in the attic. So you can see, again, it's sort of a substantial intervention where we've put the I-beams over the top of the existing roof. I'm just gonna hide those controls, right. Over the top of the existing roof, we've put I-beams on the outside of the cavity wall insulation and we've renewed the floors. And we've also taken some insulation on the outside of the walls down into the ground there. Then the air tightness strategy, which you can see on the right, and we haven't done this before, is where we, um, for reasons that should become clear as we go through, we wanted to wrap the house with an air tightness layer, which is the Partel membrane. <clears throat> um, and obviously that has to allow water vapor to escape. So the, the red the red lines down at the bottom right hand part of that screen show you the elements that are airtight in a sort of more conventional way. So the, the new concrete slab, which is in there, the mass of that, that's the airtightness layer that is taped to the masonry inner skin wall. So that's a fairly robust airtight detail. We've had to assume that um, the cavity inner leaf and then the uh, polystyrene bead insulation and the outer brickwork cavity 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 wall we have to assume across there is generally fairly airtight because you can't get to that and we just made that assumption the vertical red line on the outside is a com combination of a tanking layer uh, to prevent moisture getting into the plinth insulation and to provide a bit more resistance to the outside part of the wall but it's also an air tightness measure and then the blue line basically shows where the membrane goes from the masonry wall along the underside of the of the i-beam system up the wall to the windows and then back up over the roof and so on so it's an external air tightness wrap we did limited um air tightness measures on the inside of the building but you can see we did decide to plug the biggest holes inside and, and particularly where the sort of first floor joists there um, had sort of loose sockets into that, that area we thought we, since we had the opportunity we would just foam that okay so these are the elements <clears throat> basic elements um, down at the bottom there we have a sole plate and that's uh, that was a, a site-made i-beam sheet of plywood two pieces of two by two um, Number two are the brackets. So we had some fixing brackets, two different sizes. Number three is the placement of the first piece of air tightness membrane sealed to the wall and then left ready to lap to the membrane later on. Four are the vertical eye joists used as, as wall studs and they're at 1200 centers in order to minimize how much timber we're using. Uh, item five is the um, two by twos running vertically at 600 centers. Uh, six just shows you the volume that was 
uh, had the cellulose blown in. Seven is the air tightness membrane. Eight is the wood fiber insulation. Nine shows you the vertical counter battens, which gives you a drainage and ventilation layer. And then 10 is your cladding options. So this design started with Sawn Western Red Cedar ventilated rain screen, which we've done on other projects. In fact, we're doing on the next project. Uh, the client in the end decided to go for a fiber cement uh, interlocking board, which obviously carries a higher uh, embodied carbon penalty. Just shows you the build up of the, the U value there. So um, we've gone for a very low U value using a 300 mil uh, I stud. The next job we're doing, we'll use a 220 I stud, but even with a 195 I stud and factoring in the thermal bridging of the timber, we can still get you know, a typical passive house U value of, of just under 0.15. So as part of the, the, the project, uh, the client wanted to demolish certain adjacent structures. So a sort of a porch, um, the extension itself at the end was demolished because the block work was, once the pl plasterboard was off, you could see there were some major cracks, which he was worried about. So that was demolished, uh, but he did want to keep um, an oak frame extension, which had to be incorporated into this system. Um, the roof, uh, was rebuilt at one end to form a gable uh, at the client's request. Um, you can see on the uh, on that sort of internal shot there that the internal face behind the, the, the various plasterboard linings, there was all sorts of stuff going on. Um, and, uh, and some of that involved moving windows around. And then on the, the, the two bottom right there, you can see the I-beam construction for the extension just being started. So in terms of like individual components for this system, the I-beam is a, something I'm sure you're all, you're all familiar with, uh, softwood flanges and, a, and an OSB web piece glue, uh, glued in. Um, to create the new overhang, having wrapped the building in these I-beams, to create the new overhang and give the impression of, of, of rafters, uh, we used uh, false rafters, what we call them, um, and we actually tested those by fixing them to a wall and everybody hanging off them to see how strong they were. They're, they're perfectly strong enough. On the bottom right there, you can see the, uh, the membrane having gone on and the wood fiber board. He's, these are the brackets. The engineer on the job, he worked out the sort of worst case loadings on, on this system and gave us some rules of thumb basically it was written down on a drawing, but just a sort of indication of where these brackets should be placed and maximum centers and so on. Um, Tim, I don't know if you want to mention anything about that tricky detail there where we had to put on an airtight seal behind that structural work. Uh, Tim, I think you're, you're muted. <laughs> probably saying something sorry the, the point the only really was that the, the order was done wrong that the, the membrane should have been taped to the wall before the base plate went on and it wasn't so just adds extra complexity if you don't do it in a in, a, in the logical order yes i think the contractors learn very fast though don't they once they've been through that and made a couple of mistakes yeah it it, it, it gels yeah i think um this tim is another question for you is you know here it is a sort of minimal timber use you know minimal timber use framework on the outside and it was designed to to use very little timber and to be fast and i think you that's one of the things you liked about it is that right yeah and um although the diagram andy show, showed earlier showed 10 different parts or components of this overall build-up if you look at it as in that photo there it's actually quite straightforward is you know there's half a dozen eye joists and a bunch of two by two holding it together with some ply on the bottom. So getting that across to the uh, to the builder wasn't hard work. And once they got started, they just flew through it. So in mm. terms of a, of a system that you're trying to get people to adopt who aren't familiar with doing things in different ways, this, this ticked, ticked the box, you know, they picked it up quickly and they were able to, to build it fast. Yeah, great, thanks. So you can just see these aren't components, though, but it just shows a bit of detailing. And I'm really showing this because as we move towards more timber based products, um, we're particularly concerned about not, not forgetting and brick. Brick construction is very good at keeping the rats out, basically. And, uh, and it's something that we really shouldn't lose sight of that, uh, you know, rats and, uh, and other rodents, other beasties are, uh, 
are potentially quite a, a problem. It depends on the insulation you use to some extent, uh, and also the sort of ground conditions in terms of tunneling distance. There's a quite a good American website I came across about how to design buildings to discourage rats from, from getting in. So again, just looking at some of the thermal modeling we did, um, this is to ensure that the comfort conditions at the edge in, in, in the living rooms and the studies where people sit for long periods of time uh, are warm enough. I won't go into the building physics of it, but Passive House has got very good solid um, uh, evidence as to why uh, small temperature differentials from the ground to your shoulders when you're sitting down can cause discomfort, even if the room temperature is 22 degrees, air temperature is 22. Um, and we've seen that, we felt that in practice in various previous projects, so we take it quite seriously. Um, in terms of value engineering, there is some scope in looking at whether the plinth insulation should, on the outside of that EWI system, needs to go into a trench in the ground, could it not go to the ground? And the social housing project we're working on, the contractors are asking us to look at that. And so if we can get the results we want without having to dig trenches around the outside of buildings, clearly that's a very sensible thing to be, to be looking at. Uh, one of the final components here is the window boxes. So you can see from the lower, from, from that middle bottom slide there, the when you take off the linings on the inside of, of, of some of these um, homes, there's a sort of chaos of stuff behind. It's a, a palimpsest. I know Lloyd Alter, who's here, likes that word, but um, it's uh, you know the layers, the historical layers of work that people have done. And uh, we basically tried to not do anything in terms of air tightness, expensive parging, not only because of the time and the labour, because cement layers actually carry quite a, a high upfront um, emitted carbon cost. So we're trying to cut out cementitious layers wherever we wherever we can. It all adds up. Um, but you can see that the idea was that the, the plywood window boxes, FSC certified plywood window boxes, uh, were made up to a schedule to take the, the window units when they when they arrived on site. And they were basically installed through the chaos of the old building and out to meet a datum line, which is the outside of the of the I beams. So on the bottom right there, you can see that some of the sort of, you know, sort of tumble down broken parts of the of the wall, however that might arise, doesn't matter. That just gets all absorbed by the cellulose insulation when it gets when it gets pumped in. So in terms of identifying where the, the these risks are, I mean, are there any risks? Is this system risky? We, we've, we've, from previous research, we've seen that if this was mineral fibre insulation, we would be much more concerned about the interstitial condensation risk on the coal side of that structure where it meets the wood fibre. Um, so you've seen that uh, Partel did a woofy for us, um, uh, but we've also got these data loggers in to give us a environmental condition profile through the building, um, which we're sort of getting quite used to doing now. And that allows us, particularly if we identify the areas of risk we're worried about, or might be worried about, is to look at whether um, during construction, during the drying out phase, and during normal operation, whether any vulnerable elements like timber uh, exceed critical thresholds. So, you know, sort of moisture content, humidity, temperature can all combine over time, over certain periods of time, um, to put these timbers at risk. So this is what we'll be doing once we start getting the data in. So here you can see bottom, basically we chose um, a wall, which is going to be most likely the worst condition. We did take it away from the DPC level, so it's about a metre up, uh, but it's on the north facing wall. So you don't get any benefit from solar gain sort of helping helping the moisture balance. So it's on a shaded north facing wall and we've put sensors into the masonry behind the old render. We have put it onto the timber flange right next to that. and We put it onto the timber flange on the cold side. And we've also buried um, in the cavity wall insulation uh, the same block of same type of wood with a sensor on it as well. So we'll be able to look at the different environmental conditions through that wall construction and then analyze it. And we started getting data, as you can see top right, this is an unheated building without the MVHR system installed at the moment. So once that heating system is it, once the heat pump is turned on, you will start to see these graphs separate because you're going to get more uh, sort of warmer structure on the inside um, relative to the outside. And then finally, I think this is the final one. Yep, yeah, final two slides. Um, 
this is previous work we did with Passive House Association Island, where we used the uh, pH ribbon that was mentioned earlier to look at elements of a typical Irish building regs house based on a local authority's specification. And we worked with Jeff Colley of uh, Passive House Plus to um, look at incremental changes and then more significant changes to take some of these elements into lower carbon ways of building. Cut a long story short, we found it a useful exercise and you can see that moving from a masonry cavity wall out to a, a timber frame wall can potentially bring down the impact for that particular house from changing the wall construction from 25 tonnes to 14 and a half tonnes, um, arguably with other benefits as well. And as part of that, I'm not going to get into carbon accounting because it's, it's too fast paced to, to do so. But um, in terms of that, some of the carbon that, that uh, involved is actually stored in that assembly until such time as it burns down or it's recycled or it's dismantled and so on. Um, so normally uh, that is, a, we assume, a 60 year life cycle. You can change the lifetime, assume for the building. Um, and within that 60 year building lifetime, different components will have different lifetimes. So this program actually calculates, you know, how many times a heat pump is, is has to be sort of replaced and so on. And what we're thinking of doing with this project, this is the final slide, what we're thinking of doing with this project is developing a bit of a ready reckoner. So we're actually working out the upfront carbon, which is stages A1 to A5, upfront CO2 emissions. Um, we're looking at how much carbon is sequestered or stored in the assembly. And then we're looking at sort of the end of life implications because what happens at the end of life is unknown, but there are standard assumptions and our Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors assumes 75% uh, is incinerated and 25% is landfilled. Now, as designers, we can help change the destiny of these um, uh, components, what happens to them, but we obviously it's, it's a long time in the future, so you have to have some assumptions. Um, over here on the right, as part of the uh, standard um, lifetime carbon accounting, um, you can, this, this, what we're trying to do is encourage designers to think ahead so that making things easily reusable, maintaining the value of these timber components so that they will more likely be reused, avoiding composite products which are hard to, to repurpose or reuse. So this thinking does need to happen now, and this is something we really want to encourage. So we'll be firming these figures up, but you just get a sense here of how each component carries you know has is responsible for upfront emissions and the idea is that if you're going to if somebody wants to adopt this system they can just measure the linear meters around the building they can measure the square area and they give themselves a, a sort of rough idea of what the uh, upfront embodied carbon emissions might be from from applying it and we may do some comparisons with for example polystyrene external wall insulation and so on thank you I was really interested in Andy, plenty of data to think about there over the next few days. I have a half a page full of notes here on stuff I'm going to follow up with, but one particularly jarring point I thought was the 900 square miles of wall surface that we're going to have to deal with in, in the UK. And you have some similar, I suppose, scary targets here in Ireland. So we're looking at 500,000 homes to retrofit and, and it's quite a, a challenge that we need to face. So I, I work in an advisory role in the Centre of Excellence for Retrofitting here in Ireland. And as part of that, we're looking at EWI. And I think it's a really important point that we can't overlook. Number one, of course, the embodied carbon, which you just touched on, but the workforce to get people to do that to 500,000 properties is going to be a real challenge for us here. And I think uh, the word you used was variety with EWI. I think that's really crucial to being able to deliver on these targets. It's, it's great to I suppose, have the desire to do it, but to have the manpower is, is something else. And I suppose, Tim, it's a question for you. Did, was there much involved with teaching the guys to work with a system like this? I know with the likes of an EPS system, while well, there's the embodied carbon issue there, there's also the issue of, you know, specialist installers and so on required. And, and that sometimes just isn't possible for such a large scale uh, retrofit market. So is that something, Tim, that I suppose required a lot of handholding or did the guys take to it fairly quickly? No, it didn't really, Dara, to be honest, because they'd had some previous experience with timber frame. They're mostly used to working with masonry construction, but they'd done some timber frame before, so they built stud walls. So, you know, they quickly grasped 
the concept that basically it's just a bloody big stud wall fixed on the outside of an existing building. So that was fine. And then putting the membranes on, um, you know, that was simple. They're used to using vapor barriers before. Uh, wood fibers, just like putting plasterboard on. So generally it was, it was pretty straightforward. The, the uh, complicated bits really were things like get, uh, getting window boxes right, um, thinking about the airtightness details ahead, as we mentioned earlier, so that you, you don't get back yourself into a corner where it's hard fix harder to address once you've you've already done something else but no generally um, they didn't find it i think it's something that uh, you know it's, it's something that could be lost in such an interesting presentation but it's a really important aspect to scaling up retrofit you know we're not talking about individual dwellings here we're talking about lots and lots of work that has to be done so really interesting guys thanks and um yeah i'll just say well done guys it looks like a fantastic project and I know, obviously, your history, a lot of retrofits under your belt now. I'm not sure everyone is exactly in the same place, but it does feel like the knowledge is there. And if we were even thinking about repeatable systems, the number of times I see the same I-beams, warm cell, uh, the wood fiber board all coming together, that, that does seem like um, a solution that's used on a lot of low energy projects. Um, I wanted to sort of bring it back a bit to reality because we've had doubling gas prices quite recently. And I found a few people have contacted me asking for advice. What should I do? Generally, they're thinking along the lines of, oh, is there some magic kind of heater which is going to solve all my problems and cost nothing? But when you start to explain the approach of what you need to do to actually sort things out, they're a bit Oh, well, that, that's not what I want to hear. That's not the answer. So all those miles of insulation that needs to get done, I think is slightly trickier. And, and I don't know, you know, if, if gas doubled again, which it could easily do, is that going to trigger a bit more? And then I'll also flip it that, you know, we're actually following a retrofit project in the hub at the moment, and it's been a complete eye opener. But the amount of money that must have been spent, I still don't think this is being reflected in the value of the house and this is a wealthy area if you're in a, a poorer area that investment is a big investment and one final thing um, my dad is he's very keen on making his house more efficient and so forth but again it's, it's a similar challenge of he's got the money to do it but personally I'm a little bit worried that if he went ahead and did a big retrofit project given the location where he is, that the next people might not come along, completely ignore what's been built there and knock the whole thing down and start again, which may be a bit cynical, but it wouldn't surprise me. So I've got all those, those sorts of things going on, but I think the technical side of things you guys have got covered, and I know through the ACB, you're trying to filter out all that knowledge. So well done. I just want to congratulate you and thank you. Um... I'm, I'm grateful that people like you exist and are doing this really it's a it's a labor of it's a labor of love and you are going above and beyond what what most people do in their in their line of work and um you know I, i'm involved in trying to systematize um a new build product which you might say is uh is is easy uh, relatively speaking um we're we're doing the best we can in our world but you're trying to systematize something for retrofits with the, many of the same uh, values and ambitions that we have in terms of resource efficiency, um, material use um, and achievability and simplicity and all of these things that we're doing in our easy new build paradigm. Um, and, I, and I bow down to the scale of your ambition. I, I'm particularly interested in, in actually in the, in the ambition to um, uh, to let go of this, I think if I if I understood you correctly, Tim, you 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 said something about, you know, wanting to get this to a point where you no longer had your arms around it and could could release it out, out there into the world for for use by others. I guess once you've ironed out and you know ironed out the issues and and developed the system, it, is is it is it something you could just just feed back on a little bit? Is is your your longer term ambition for the system? Um, I'm not sure whether that's something you're better to comment on, Andy. Um, but I think that generally through the ACB, we're, we're, we're planning to 
to have a, another seminar through the ACB, which goes into this in more detail, but it's certainly something we'd, we'd be happy to share details with um, sort of to anybody who's interested. Uh, there aren't enough people, you know, this, this, as you saw, there's so many of these jobs to be done around the world. There just aren't enough people to do it. So we're not in a competitive situation right now. We just need to be sharing all best practice with everybody. And hopefully, you know, things will come back and overall you'll lift, lift the whole boat. I think um, picking up on <clears throat> Ben's, you know, perhaps not overly cynical kind of take on this. So it's been interesting for me to uh, be thrown into the, what was the eco program, you know, let's not be on, let's not be beat around the bush, you know, banging measures, individual measures onto buildings with not linking them up, not overly worried that they work, that they will bypass their leakage, performance nowhere near what's designed, you know, and sometimes with really serious consequences of, of, of damp and mold, uh, with this new approach of, of, of a quality assured process, because it's not just about individual technical solutions, I'm sure you all know this, or, or um, in, you know, all sort of knowledgeable areas like the ACB or individual people. It's a cultural kind of its values. And what I'm finding, and it's quite painful, I have to say, working within the delivery infrastructure under this new scheme for social housing retrofit is um, the systems carry forward this lack of awareness about performance or even care about performance. It's just not built into the, the systems. And um, and, and so we're the, we, we find ourselves as retro designers using PHPP saying, I know that your SAP said that you can hit this government target. Um, but we're finding that it's, it's more than double what you'll get. And knowing as well that probably it's even worse than we're saying. And they're seeing us as, oh, you nerds using PHPP. And, you know, we rec they recognize our knowledge and our understanding but it's just very alien to them. And whilst if we had a hundred years to sort this out, I'd be feeling pretty relaxed about it. Thinking, oh, we could keep pushing and we'll get somewhere, but we don't have a hundred years. We kind of got, well, we, we haven't got any time, have we? So <laughs> the, the, the challenge is insane. Um, now I'm not saying that, you know, when change happens, it doesn't happen very fast, but, but certainly, you know, going from the cosy world of projects like this, where the client's really into what you're doing and you're working with other ACB members to, you know, the, 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 the rooms full of men managing <laughs> small number of builders. And, you know, it's, it's a very different environment and, and we're going to stick at it. But I have to say, it's been incredibly stressful to be out on such a limb in that environment. And uh, I don't think we're making ourselves particularly popular in some quarters, but the housing associations are, I think, generally more focused on hearing. They understand because it's their tenants that see the heating bills. So coming back to this system, what we're, you know, it's what we're doing, I think is useful. It will become useful, but it will only become meaningful if cultural value, if it comes from the top. Politicians have to be absolutely clear. If it was a war and they wanted to win a war, they would make sure they won that war. When it comes to uh, rolling out massive energy efficiency to deliver genuine performance, it's a completely different ball game. And I can see that coming all the way down, you know. And so until that changes, meanwhile, some of the industry is changing how they do it. They're mobilizing, they're starting to buy into what we're talking about. I say we, as in, you know, doing the right thing. But it's a long, long, long process and it's going to have to speed up. Otherwise, what we're doing is interesting and potentially useful, but potentially meaningless as well. Well, I know that we've had a lot of really good questions, so we're running a little bit over. And I think Zach, as our man with the questions, how many have you got there? I have lots of I have lots of questions. It's been a very active chat. Really great questions. Um, so I'm going to jump uh, into that process real fast. Before I do, I want to say a couple of thank yous. Um, of course, thank you to Andy and Tim for this great pr presentation and uh, in advance for your answers to these questions. And thank you to our co-hosts for for making this happen. Um, also, thank you to our sponsors at the Passive House Accelerator. So our founding sponsors are 475 High Performance Building Supply. Baxed Ingui Architects, Glavel Foam Glass Gravel, Minotaur All-in-One HVAC and Dehumidification Units, Mitsubishi Electric Train HVAC US, Partel, 
RDH Building Science, Rockwell North America, StoCorp, and Zola Windows. Our champion sponsors are Icon Windows and Doors and SEGA, and our stakeholder partner is NYSERDA, the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. Thank you too to our patron sponsors, Aero Aggregates, Aero Barrier, BR Plus A Consulting Engineers, Brennan Brennan Air Tightness and Insulation, Euroline Windows, Inotech Windows and Doors, Lamalux, Sanderson Sustainable Design, and US Engineered Wood T Stud. So thank you to our sponsors. All right, so we are going to get into to questions and answers. And um, I uh, normally would have the list queued up for you, but I don't. So I'm just gonna throw it out here that the first the first question is gonna be from Stephen Howland. Steve, and I'm gonna make sure that Stephen is still here. Stephen, if you could unmute yourself and uh, you had two questions, if you could um, choose one of them now and I'll get back to you for the second one um, in the queue. Oh, uh, you don't have a microphone. Got it. Okay. So his, Stephen's first question was, if in 10 years the house is sold to someone else or upgrades are being carried out, when someone is redoing an energy rating, will the owner slash client have all the required details sub to substantiate a non-default U-value, air permeability, thermal bridging, et cetera? Have you redone an energy rating calculation based off its defaults had it to be used. I'm not, I don't understand the, the second part of the question, but the, I think the main, the, the part of this is documentation of-, of, um, of Yeah, of documentation data. is important, yeah. yeah. Uh, we haven't yet done the SAP rating, uh, the, the produce the PC certificate, and um, we will be doing that. Whether it comes out as a B or an A, probably come out as an A, do you think, Tim? Yeah, I would have This one. Yeah, um, it doesn't sit very well with the passive house methodology and tool set, but um, that, that, that's, that's one thing. Uh, yeah, clients do need to have information about the building, but particularly in, and, and that needs to be in a robust format that, um, you know, lasts the, the, the test of time. But I suppose, you know, electronic formats, maintaining a link with new owners, with the architects um, is, is part of that. You know, so they know who to call. Basically, we do do building manuals for not for for non-domestic buildings. It tells people how to run it, what to look out for, who to contact if something breaks. It tells you how to fit stuff to walls. You know, if you've done some IWI, people need a bit of guidance on that because we all forget. You know, can I do this? Can I do that? What fixing do I use? We haven't done it. We haven't done it for domestic buildings. It's just it's just another thing that we don't get paid for. So. Um, you know, we, we, if we were doing, perhaps when we're doing, you know, hundreds of retrofit homes, for example, under this, 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 this program, we'll have to think of a more coherent way of doing that. Although that is built into PAS, the PAS 2035 process, they do collect documentation. That's the retrofit coordinator's job. So actually they do have that, that covered. But certainly in terms of this particular project, I do like um, approaches to retrofit that takes the air barrier out of danger zone so if people drill holes in walls or knock a window out or whatever first of all they know where it is very clearly know where it is but general work general knocking about doesn't damage it so achieving air tightness with a bit of plasterboard you know and, and some sort of tape in in various hidden corners that, that easily gets moved around and breaks the air barrier is not a good idea i'm a, I, a, ideally you'd want to retrofit buildings in ways that are just you can almost you know it's protected for 100 years as this Air tightness has to last for decades without being compromised. So that's where we need to go. Great. Thank you, Andy. Okay, so up next is Luke McNeely. Thank you. Uh, this is an awesome presentation. Thank you guys so much. And just echoing what was said before, you are leading the way in a great area. Um, you mentioned uh, concern about uh, using uh, hydrophobic insulation materials in the um, eye joists, uh, and that was somewhat in context uh, just after talking about the metal fasteners um, holding on the sheathing. And I, I have not done any of the the detailed thermal bridge calculations or condensation risk calculations, um, and I don't quite understand why the cellulose is a better choice in that case. Um, yeah. I have heard, however, that cellulose can hold moisture 
more and sometimes that can be a concern because now it's uh, <laughs> a moist uh, cellulosic fiber next to more cellulosic fiber. Um, so anyway, I'd love to hear. It's fairly that. straight. Yeah, it's fairly straightforward. So in terms of, um, you know, wh where does the moisture risk come from? Well, the high magnitude moisture risk is liquid water coming from rain, leaks, floods, whatever, you know, so we're not actually thinking necessarily concerned about that in this context they take the sort of mass liquid water out of the equation so um, then the next level magnitude is uh, rising or penetrating damp you know so um, down at the bottom of this wall system we were um, uh, you know very paid a lot of attention to detail to you know what are the ground conditions is the capillary movement of moisture up through some old dpc some dysfunctioning you know layer of slate or whatever because it's fine when there's nothing on the walls when you've got a little bit of rising damp going on i think uh, the water vapor can evaporate from the base of the walls fine but the moment you take out free air movement by putting something against it even a little bit of rising damp could start to cause some problems so where the dpc is not to be relied on we do put a hydrophobic brick cream injection into the mortar joint just to make sure that we don't have problems you know 10 20 30 years down the line but then leaving aside and going to the next level magnitude the sort of lesser magnitude risk it's interstitial condensation to do with water vapor so as you probably know almost all houses in a, in a heating climate like ours, the water vapor pressure inside a house from activities and cooking and whatever um, is always higher. The, the water vapor pressure is higher inside than outside. So water vapor is moving through building structures until it meets something that's impermeable. If it meets something impermeable on the warm side, it doesn't matter. If it meets something impermeable on the cold side, it will build up water vapor pressure will build up and it will condense and you're going to get interstitial condensation if that happens it's really good to have the material where that happens as a hygroscopic capillary active material that allows a little bit of distribution of that point of, of condensation and and certainly if it then has a drying path it can then sort of dry out and it just reduces the peaks of moisture so so warm cell is is, is very useful is very useful for that. One thing to bear in mind is that water vapor pressure might be going that direction, but if it condenses and turns to liquid water, it can actually travel in the opposite direction through capillary reaction, which is something that's quite important to, to, to think about as to why. Um, oh, okay, so, so um, the risk here is that we do not have an internal vapor barrier. If we had an internal vapor barrier to reduce water vapor getting into the construction and a vapor open outside face to allow anything that did get through that to escape on the outside, you could use mineral fiber and we wouldn't have a problem with that at all. So a new building with I beams and a vapor control layer on the inside, mineral fiber, fine. You know, although rats do like mineral fiber quite a lot, um, coming back to rats. Uh, but in this project, we have blocked gaping holes in the internal wall to reduce bulk transfer of water vapor through into the wall construction, but we haven't put a vapor barrier there. So it's potentially very sensitive to uh, moisture building up somewhere. Woofy is great. You know, we're looking at a sort of a sort of idealized calculation. And there are always some areas, you know, maybe in a bathroom with showers, maybe there's a hole that hasn't been filled. There's a lot of water vapor able to get into the construction. We want to build in robustness and, 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 and hygroscopic materials like warm cell build in robustness and and and, and reduce the buildup of moisture in one particular area and allows it to dry back in or redistribute it uh, as conditions around the, the assembly change does that answer it yes thank you I, I i needed that understanding and i think i got uh from that that condensation around the uh for instance a cold spot like a fastener yeah, could in fact uh, lead to a rotting out of the material that that fastener is attached to. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. Um, so next up is Mick Woolley. Hi. Um, yes, Hi, Mick Woolley. Uh, Hi. Um, <laughs> yes, I've got um, I, my son's looking at a 1900 house that he's got so i from this your presentation i can see that um 
there's uh, you've got a fairly straightforward shape and uh you've got a fairly straightforward construction he's got things like character brickwork on the, on the front and, and back of the house and he's got coving internally and he's got he's got the potential to put external wall insulation of some sort on one side and i should say it's a semi-detached but when you get to this sort of thing um i can see quite easily that I could we could do external wall insulation i get he's quite um i think he's not keen on, on on doing anything at the front and i suspect he's not keen on internal wall insulation do we get any bangs for the buck at all out of doing part of the house yes <laughs> yeah. so this is very topical in the sense that so we've done a project at a place called Cannon Pion in Herefordshire, where with a housing association, which is a historic solid walled house or a traditional solid wall house with a 1970s yeah. extension and a stone wall. So we did do external wall insulation on the gable, the rear wall, and we put a high performance cavity wall insulation in. The front wall we did with internal wall insulation for very similar reasons that you, you just alluded to and it works really well with the internal wall insulation if you didn't have the internal wall insulation you would get um obviously a much higher a higher heat loss and you would also potentially have some thermal comfort issues you know particularly in those rooms i mentioned the living room so maybe you could you could choose the rooms in terms of thermal comfort you could choose the rooms um that the, the might suffer from that and put a bit of internal wall insulation in if you can't do either side of the wall you are going to have a big cold lump aren't you and if it's a west facing wall maybe there'll be less maybe it'll be less um you know less, less problems in terms of um thermal performance on this property i was talking about it was a west facing wall we had internal wall insulation and because we had sensor sensors in there we could see that the evening sun would heat the brickwork up and about eight hours later it would get through nine inches of brickwork and it would reach the bedrooms on the other side so in, in summer that was a problem by putting internal wall insulation in you what the benefit we got from that west facing wall was um, the bedrooms didn't overheat as much but also the dew point never was reached in reality it didn't it was predicted to have a, a dew point condensation risk which we'd managed through the way we designed the system but that dew point was never reached because of the time lag of the solar energy getting through to the back of the wall about 11 or 12 o'clock at night so but at the end of the day yes you you'll just have to take the energy penalty that will be increased greenhouse gas emissions unless you go to a heat pump and the grid is following up with decarbonized electricity so I think it is worth doing. Wrap as much of the building as you can. Having said Andy, that, I think this yeah. is, is going to be quite a, a common scenario. And I can picture yes. even in my village, I've been watching one and yes. thinking, do you really know what you're doing here? You're putting a lump of insulation on the side here. You've changed your windows. Yeah. But has there been a lost opportunity? Because you know, you've done a lot, but well, I'll tell you why it's so topical is because this social housing project we're looking at, it's got 70 homes as a mixture of bungalows and semi-detached. We're looking at the semi-detached group and there are 30 in this group. It's got cavity wall insulation of some quality and we are and, and the, the, the pressure from, from, from the project was to put external wall insulation all around it. Now, some of those houses have got mock Tudor. Uh, fronts, they've got a little bit of detailing of brickwork and people don't really like seeing lumps of insulation shoved on the front it looks ugly people react against it the community reacts against it so we actually argued we seem to have won this argument that uh, where the properties are already rendered or ugly on the front fine put it on but give tenants the choice i like my brick wall give tenants the choice of not insulating the front wall insulate the sides the back the extension uh, attic insulation you know do what you can on the ground floor um but leave and have internal wall insulation on the inside not in this first phase of works but later as part of the medium term improvement plan that'll be a later measure so so you know that has been popular as they do tenant liaison they find that you know quite a lot of people saying well i i would go i would go for this set of improvements but i don't want to cover the front wall so actually what we've been arguing for um, which has actually met some resistance because they they want to just achieve the target. Now, in terms of how that performs as space heat demand, 
using PHPP, we are hovering around about 90, 85 to 90 kilowatt hours after a full retrofit. So, you know, you're not at 50, not at 25, you're at 90. Now, um, the current government target for these projects is 50. They're going to change it to 90. 50 looks like the more sustainable target. So 50 plus a heat pump or mass would work. 90 plus a heat pump looks like it will be breaking the grid in 2050. So it's a bit of a challenge. Form factor, compact homes easier to deal with, better lower energy to run. Semi-detached and bungalows are going to be breaking the 50. They're going to be up in the in the 90s, really. If we didn't do anything, they're up at the sort of 150, 200. You know, well, they are if people heat their homes properly. People can live at passive house levels if they live at 12 degrees centigrade in the winter, you know. And when you talk to the national grid, they have a set of assumptions about how they will see heat demand reduce over time. Part of that is just a trickle of, you know, your typical energy efficiency, a bit more loft insulation and so on. But hidden away in their assumptions are people will heat their buildings less. People will only heat one room. Now, they say, we don't understand about buildings. Tell us, you know, we want to learn about buildings. But they've had to make some assumption about reducing demand whilst they increase electricity, decarbonised electricity production. So hidden away in their assumptions is people will be cold. People will be living in one room. Now, that could be the reality of climate change and the energy crisis meeting the UK population. And I think it probably will be. So what we're doing now is really showing what might have been had we started in the 1970s and had political willpower to actually do proper building programs. So really it's, it's catch up how many people will we be able to help. That, yeah, thanks Andy. Um, yes, very interesting points. And I can quite agree with some of that. I, I've got to go away now and uh, convince my son to to go for it. He, uh, the good news is he does at least want to, uh, it's, uh, his starting point was that he wanted to get to having a heat pump. So. Well, so I think that you've, you've raised an issue which does need to be tackled, which is this cost yeah. of running heat pumps. So, so the government yeah. has signalled, hasn't it, that it's going to take the social costs off the electricity bill and they're going to move it over a period of 10 years onto the gas bill, which means that electricity costs per unit will go down and costs of gas per unit will go up. But in the meantime, if you don't reduce the demand and you put a larger heat pump on, you will be paying a, quite a lot of money to run a heat pump unless you reduce demand. So if you've got the capital to reduce your heat demand to around 50, you should get a reasonable balance where your some of the projects we've modeled show that aiming for the ACB retrofit standard does tend to find a balance where your electricity bill to run the heat pump at 250, 300% efficiency is about the same as what you're paying for gas. So it's not cheaper to run, but it's not more expensive. As your heat demand goes up, you're gonna be spending more on your heating bills. Hope that was useful. Oh, that's fantastic, Andy. Thank you. Um, I so Pete, I was actually wrong. D Douglas is still here. Some, somehow he he uh, I don't see him on the participants list, but he's definitely here. So Douglas, you're going to be up next. Before we get to your question, Douglas, I just wanted to um, ask Andy and Tim. We we have ha have a request um, for a link to the Herefordshire uh, Her Herefordshire project. Um, so if you oh, yes. if you have that link and could share it, I think folks would enjoy that. So uh, yeah. Douglas, fire away. Hi, you know, thanks. That's very interesting. Small p political political presentation. Um, now I just want to ask you, as from the point of view of people who live in apartments, are they really left out in the cold? <laughs> apartments. Um, we yeah, we haven't done many apartments. Um, we, there was another tranche in the, this social housing project which had more apartments. Um, for some reason, I can't remember what the reason was, but the contractor who was employing us wanted to avoid those. Um, they should be, they should be easier, I would have thought, you know, it's I've, less surface I've been involved area. in some, Andy, just to give some context. We've worked on a couple of projects, some Please, to the benefit yeah. standard and, and some to other, again, meaningful energy standards. but. You need to get buy-in from the developer or the owner of the pro of the property, obviously, but the, the potential is huge. Like you said, Andy, it's it's actually quite a lot easier to make quite a big difference. You know, you have to 
obviously deal with a larger building but if you can get buy-in from the developer or the owner or, or the council if that's the case you mean do the block do huge. the block exactly you'd have to really yeah. do them as a block it's the way to go yeah. um, but we have done quite a few of those here in ireland um, and they've been really really successful there are some good examples in london as well of passive house retrofits to, uh, to could you comment on like heat pumps plus apartments well, you need the buy-in for that. I don't think you get, you just get blockage as otherwise. <laughs> well, yes, that, that issue of heat pumps in the Palmas. So, so the ACB has a new build standard and we do have a route for exemptions. We have had somebody recently, it was a very interesting conversation about can they claim an exemption and do direct electric heating in an, in an apartment block? And the arguments are, well, the sort of the jury is slightly out on it at the moment, but you know, in in, in with, with small properties and the risk of overheating and so on, um, how hot water and heating is provided, it's not necessarily straight to you know having multiple heat pumps is not necessarily the the, the best route. This is an area I'm slightly weak on. Um, we have had some ACB webinars on it, uh, and certainly for that sort of type of, of property. You could have a yeah a very interesting more focused discussion around sensible approaches to you know when is direct electric heating more appropriate than than heat pumps you yeah, know that, that would be an interesting topic mm. because you know okay i know the proportion is smaller of people living in communal buildings but they still exist so. mm. yeah yeah for sure uh, Douglas, the Roaches Town Avenue project in Dublin is a good example. There's a lot of case studies online about that project. It's an interfit, retrofit um, apartment block there in Dublin, if you want to have a look at that. Okay, great. Thanks, Milan. Okay. Thanks, Douglas. Okay, Pete, you're up next. Hi, Andy. Yeah, um, great, great presentation, guys. Um, quick question that you just touched on there briefly earlier. Um, in, in terms of a lot of these social housing projects where we, there's a target of around 50 kilowatts per hour, um, the, the, the measures, EWI, CWI, doors, windows, uh, ventilation measures seem quite attainable, but we often run into the issue with the floors. Did you have any ideas on you know, uh, 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 ways to attack the floor to try and get those targets under 50? <clears throat> yeah, the floors, floors are the issue. So in the private projects, We've looked at, you know, working in shallow crawl spaces, and I know that the, the Qbot, the the robot that sprays polyurethane mm -hmm. foam with an operator, is is something that's going to happen. In um, I've got colleagues who've used. It. In fact, we did the initial. We did some supporting research for them to help them profile uh, their spray pattern so that it doesn't interfere with the moisture risks at the end of joists and sleep walls. Um, and they are having some good sort of results reported. And it's a kind of like this is where um, sort of needs of the circular economy, you know, not covering reusable, future usable components in foam that then compromises their ability to be reused will become increasingly important. But it's far future stuff this is. Um, and so as a sort of straight fix, you know, sending a robot into a narrow crawl space and spraying foam on the underside of Joyce, it looks like they're starting to get, you know, pretty good at it. And And, and, and when I'm sort of see a bit more performance data over the next couple of years you know it'll maybe be a bit more convinced by it. but certainly somebody i respect uh, at inhabit has been doing work uh, analyzing and, and monitoring you know what they've been doing and and she's um, very sort of supportive of them so suspended was but but we generally try to get a better result by taking the floors out uh, and doing a proper solid insulated floor with the issue that we then of course have to emit carbon for the concrete um and so the question is you know i think we're still at an early stage of understanding how much carbon budget can we actually invest in order to reduce operational emissions and again if we had more time you know decades more time i think we'd understand how we would be doing that that it is worth some relatively small upfront emissions to ensure you know 60 to 100 years of low operational energy because it does dwarf it you know the emissions dwarf it especially if the um materials are becoming decarbonized you know you could you could invest quite a lot in a in a, in a floor renewal to get high comfort and, and good performance but we're not there yet and uh it all seems to be about the next 10 years so it really is a bit of a <laughs> sort of hard thing to get your head around my 
gut feel is we have very little ecological room. So I'm not quite sure where that leaves us. We might be back to the cold homes thing. Um, on the social housing projects, there's a phase one set of works which is, is designed not to go in, not to decant the tenants. So we can do as much as we can on the outside. And then as part of the whole house plan, you have to say, what will you do when that property becomes empty and you can go and do something on the inside? And um, one of the, the, the solutions we are proposing as a thin aerogel layer with a, um, a magnet, um, calcium, uh, magnesium oxide board on top. And it's basically just a, a 16 mil layer, which raises the temperature of these cold concrete floors uh, and, and reduces energy loss, you know, sort of significantly. And so that that's the plan, which involves cutting a little bit off all the internal doors just to accommodate that extra thickness. So there right. are sort of technical solutions. That's great. Thank you. I haven't, I haven't come across that aerogel solution. That's, that's great. Thanks. All right. Thank you. So next up is Stephen Howland. And Stephen doesn't have a, a microphone, I believe. So I'm going to ask the question on his behalf. And that is, if you insulate a wall externally or internally and your neighbor doesn't insulate their walls also, could you accidentally increase a condensation risk at the party wall on the neighbor's side due to your wall now being insulated? Yeah, but how significantly or worrisome that is, I'm not sure. I mean, we have we have kind of looked at, at that and, and in the carbonite, ACB carbonite training course, we do say be careful here. Um, and, and part of that can also be, you know, there's no DPC in older properties. And as I said before, you know, maybe the sort of evaporation both sides of the wall is sort of right. Um, if you, you know, perhaps tank a bit of the wall and put some internal wall insulation on, you could be then building up the moisture and it, it evidences itself with salt damage on their plaster, you know, and if they put two and two together, yeah, potentially for sure. I mean, all of these things make sense. If you do the whole block, if, if, a, if, a, if a street of terraces just say, we're all getting together. We've got a new community group going. We're going to do all of this project at once. We're going to insulate all our attics, all our over after insulation. We're going to, you know, insulate the sides and the backs of the terrace. And we're going to do IW on the front. And they just get it together as a community. Every day, all these, a lot of these, this, this hassle melts away and they get a much better job. And really, again, our response to climate change has to sort of just become something completely different. And whether you think that's possible or not, I don't know. But that's kind of where the logic takes us otherwise we are really making everything really really difficult and little details like this you know yeah it'll put some people off some people would do it there might be some neighbors disputes but you know it might be five years after the work's done <laughs> uh, there's another question here which is part part of kind of relates to that which i'd like to that's mark perrins he's he's saying um he's got a, a cavity wall house and he's putting some external wall insulation on and some internally and he's saying should i fill the empty 50 mil cavity absolutely or at least stop air getting into that cavity from below and scouring heat out so it, 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 you know you should yeah don't have voids between insulation potentially that's a big thermal bypass it could be connecting to the cold attic you know it could have air bricks in it there's all sorts of ways that that is not a good idea so definitely fill it i would fill it rather than put insulation on the inside to be honest fantastic thanks andy um so next up is alex gahan or gahan sorry for the mispronunciation there Alex, I see you on that. There. Hi, okay. sorry. Great. <laughs> just struggling with my tech. Uh, I, I've mentioned a couple of things. I just wanted to start by saying what a fantastic presentation. Uh, thank you so much um, to, to everybody. And I love that comment made right at the start uh, about the low energy and the meaningful innovation. Uh, I'm sure that's what the majority of us are here for. Uh, I certainly are looking to make changes to a, a 1920s house. It's brick. It's got lath and plaster on the walls, which is beginning to really bother me because um, I don't know whether I, I have to consider budgeting, taking everything, all that out. And I just wondered if the team had had a project at all yet with lath and plaster and knew you know, how I should be tackling it. Um, unfortunately, I'm in a conservation area, so external cladding isn't gonna work for me. And I have a shared access 
Uh, I'm a semi-detached, so I'd be overhanging. Uh, lots of complications, which means it's got to be internal. Um, I had thought about maybe combining it with some sound boarding um, to help with insulation as well. But um, I'm, I'm just looking for who, who I should get involved in the project that might be a Latin plaster specialist. <laughs> If you if you clone Tim, he would be the person to get involved in all that. Right, okay. And I think Tim <laughs> should 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 speak to that. But first of all, is the construction you're talking about, when you say lath and plaster, is that a solid brick wall with some internal stud work and lath and plaster? Because lath and plaster normally yeah. doesn't go on. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. Tim, have you done um, anything like that? Um. Yeah, but it normally involves taking the lath and plaster out. <laughs> okay. Okay, yeah. Um, and I, would you uh, suggest that I speak to some form of conservation specialist? Um, the, where, the thing is, where are you going to put the insulation? Um, I think it's got to go internally uh, on the, well, in the, in the in You're thinking the other side of the lath and plaster or on the inside? Uh, uh, well, lath, lath and plaster would be sort of in the middle and then, and then the plaster would sort of cover it up. Um, but I'm worried then about obviously moisture problems. Um, don't want to create issues because the house, although it's obviously not very energy efficient, actually breathes at the moment. And I am concerned about affecting that. Um, but it sounds like I possibly need to come and speak to someone who knows what they're talking about. Uh, I wouldn't it, even attempt to do it myself, but I don't want to have anybody come out and look at it and say, oh, yes, do this, this and this. And then 10 years down the line, I've got a really big problem and some structural issues on my hands. It's interesting because the, you know, the challenge is so big that you kind of want to, you as in me, <laughs> as in uh, yeah. look at, um, at the easy wins, you know, the sort yes. of ugly, you know, houses where people really are struggling for, with heating bills, which tends to be the social housing sector. When you get to houses as challenging as yours, <laughs> there are things you can do. It is expensive. It is subtle craft based kind of approaches you know using natural insulations and clever little techniques to increase air tightness without damage it becomes a labor of love in a way yeah so if you you know i've got various colleagues and acb members who are doing their labor of love on their properties and there's a couple that we're, we've been advising but who are basically retrofitting their house it's not a historic house but a lot of these same issues um, but, but, you know, it is an absolute labour of love. There isn't a nice, simple, systematic, affordable way of doing it. So you could probably start to nibble away at the problem if you're thoughtful. But, yeah, you'll end up paying a professional and it will be slow and, and you won't get a huge energy benefit. So I suppose mm. it might be worth thinking, you know, you know, why are you doing it? Perhaps, you know, maybe you could be looking at air leakage, for example, you know, maybe that actually you can make a big win with just cutting out all those wretched drafts and getting a nice ventilation system in uh, okay. and then looking at the size of the heat pump needed and think, well, is that worse than the, you know, is the running cost of that worse than a, there's going to be some buildings which are just too challenging to do much to. And yep. so you just got to look at where are the easy wins, how much will the heat pump cost? And as long as not everybody puts a massive great heat pump on, you know, maybe you know, there's going to be some buildings that are going to have to go in that direction. Mm. Or put a and on. uh I, I I totally agree with you. I think there are probably swathes of properties, slightly different in nature, but will fall into that category. And so a uh, sort of a linked question I had for you, you know, also with all the benefits and the great knowledge that you're getting from the projects that you're working on, but do you have loops back into government? Are you sharing with them what you're learning so that they really get a, a, a handle on how challenging this this is because i think they've put the heat pump grant out there they're not really even talking about epc reforms they're asking an awful lot of investment of people and it just doesn't seem to be joined up so well it's interesting yeah there's a disjunction between ministerial level i think and above and and, and civil servant level so we have actually had 13 or so Bayes civil servants on our oh, carbon light retrofit course, which is nice. Yeah, um, yeah. And they they are, and there are other groups engaging with them. And the PAS 2035 process has brought building physics right into that sort of zone. Um, and in fact, you know, there, there's some uh, people who've moved from the passive house sort of community 
you know, one of whom in particular in my mind, who's working in a, a big government department at a senior advisor level now. <clears throat> and uh, yes. as I understand it, you know, a minister turned during a meeting and said, um, you know, this, 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 this massive underperformance of buildings, is that a real thing? You know, and the advisor went, yes, it absolutely is a real thing. And the minister was going, my God, you know, I didn't realise that. So, so that's a moment that, you know, that minister might be replaced next year and then it's all start again. But the yeah. civil servant is building, the civil, um, civil service is building up an understanding, uh, say within Bayes. I think they've got a good understanding, but I think there's a, I think the reality is that the treasury is the, the, the entity that really holds our fate fate in its hands mm. and I think you know when you roll out that knowledge through programs like past 2035 rollout I think it's severely compromised by people who don't understand what's needed and and, 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 and politicians who don't have a serious intent to deliver something that works that's I think yeah. how it how it is yeah okay I, I, I'm sure everyone else wants to ask Andrew thank you ever so much <laughs> Thank you, Alex. We do have a lot of a lot more questions. I need to do a time check though with Andy and Tim and see what's realistic for you guys. This is we're we're an hour and forty minutes into this amazing session. So, um, what are are you game to continue or are do you need is life? Do you need to get back to your your lives? That's a good question, Tim. Yeah. How are you placed? I'm okay. I'm all right. I did think somebody was insisting on a meeting, but a text seems to say that it's okay. So I think I'm all right for, well, so I'm all right till, you know, for another 15 minutes, perhaps. Perfect. Okay, great. So the next question is from Eric Parks. Hi, Eric. Hi there, uh, Andy. Hi, Tim. Um, I, I think I've had a word with Andy about this before. It's a CWI related question and Mark Perrin may and or any other CWI interested people may be interested as well um when you did you do any kind of checking out of the if there are any gaps essentially in the cwi before doing work because having done that to how my own house in the last year pretty great generally but then there's clear spots like under doors essentially that are just you know gaping voids that i'm you know gonna have to go back to and sort out uh, yeah. i was wondering what your thoughts were on that well that's good we tim tim i have something to say on this um, because he did some boroscope, he did some work with the boroscope, but uh, the client did do a thermal camera survey. Okay. I yeah. think on a day that was perhaps not cold enough. It, it was, it did indicate uh, that there were some areas of concern, but it wasn't definitive enough to, to know is this a really bad job or just a sort of okay ish sort of you know, job. Tim, what did you make of the state of the cavity wall insulation? Generally, at that level, it was pretty good. Um, we drilled holes about every half meter and stuck a camera in and had a look. And there were beads there. I mean, it's, it's hard to tell what's going on in between or just above, obviously. But uh, the fact that there were beads down at that level um, mm. was was a positive sign. There were definitely air gaps in other parts of the building. I think. Do you remember that that area we found, Andy, where they'd, they'd filled in an old garage? Door. Oh yes! Oh, no cavity at all. That was it. It's just a, door on that one, yeah. yeah. Um, and then, it, in terms of under the thresholds for ground floor doors, what? Yeah, the doors any, were brought out. The doors yeah. were brought out. Uh, sorry, no, the windows were brought out, but the doors we actually set just off the top of the outer skin of the brickwork. On compact foam. On compact foam, but we had. So the, you would. So you would have opened that and seen in the cavity, I suppose. Yeah. And was that filled? I mean, because that's in my mind, it seems like there's <laughs> every kind of quote unquote, you know, certified guaranteed CWI job is missing these areas and has done for years and will continue to do so until, yeah, until something happens. There's two okay, ways so. of, there's two, the first threshold we found had no polybead in it. Yeah. But you could feel to the sides, it had gone down. So the cavities were actually fairly clear down to the old 1950s foundations. Where the extension was built, it was had more debris in it. I think as part of the knocking through into the extension, debris had got into the cavity. So at the south end, Tim, that was sort of the worst, wasn't it, in terms of debris at the bottom of the cavity. Um, I think if the if there had been many gaps 
around that level, you would have imagined that air would have found its way in and got into the house. So to get an air test result of 0.75 kind of suggests it's not terrible. Mm, yeah. Okay. Mm. Yeah. No, good. Good stuff. Thanks. And yeah, great to see this stuff. So. Fantastic. Thanks, Eric. So next up is Aki Boye Connolly. Hope, hope I got the pronunciation correct there. Yeah, uh, this is Simon Connolly. And um, Caroline says hello to Andy and Adele as well. Hi, Simon. Um, hi. Our question was about the, um, the studs, the, the vertical OSB web um, framing that you used on the exterior. Did you find that the continuous OSB actually added up to quite significant cold bridging? Because we, we did a similar construction in um, a self-built studio where we used double studs. But we only had very widely spaced intermittent connections with plywood. Uh, so it worked like a Virendil truss uh, in order to minimize the cold bridging spots. Yeah. we. I quite like homemade trusses, which just have a few plates of plywood, but it generally, Tim, you, you find that in terms of like a, a contract on site rather than a self build that buying the, uh, are the I beams about, is it 15 quid per well, six meter it, length? Or something? It works out a lot cheaper than making them on site, like to buy wood and ply and make them. It's, it's a lot more expensive. I'd say it was, probably three or four times more expensive than buying the eye joists. But also the centers are 1200 centers. So in PHPP, we've put 1.5% in for the timber fraction um, of the web, because it's only 10 mil wide and they're only every 1200 centers. So actually the answer is no, there's not significant yeah. thermal bridging from that yeah. in this system. So it's, it's very modest. Yeah, that, that we, our studs were at, at 600 centres, so there was a little bit more significance to them. And don't forget, we've got the wood fibre board riding over it as well, so that takes out the yeah. thermal uh, thermal bridging. I, I would say it's insignificant in this arrangement. Yeah. The more, more important is where two studs come together and insulation is forgotten to be put into the, the webs. Yeah. So I think the contractors also picked that up, didn't they, Tim? I think there was a period where they had not put insulation trapped in those little spaces and then they realised and started doing it. Did you actually manage to get any in in any of those missed yeah. spaces? Yeah, we yeah. did. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, we used um, hemp fibre and because that was very nice and springy, yeah. it, would, it would push itself into all the gap, into little voids yeah. in the double studs. Can, I'm using, um, using warm cell. Well, while, while I'm on, can I just mention in relation to the Q-Box um, sprayed polyurethane, we, we did an exercise on looking at the embodied carbon, the carbon footprint, um, <coughs> assuming that it's a, a petrochemical based spray. And we reckoned that it was, the carbon footprint was equivalent to about 17 years of heat loss. Uh, so we, we used, because we were very conscious of the carbon footprint, we lifted the floorboards, put some um, cellulose fiber in between the joists on a breather membrane and put the floorboards back. Yeah, I think the, the, the reason that well, Qbots raise on Detra is where a lot of floors need to be done and tenants can't be moved out. <clears throat> I think that, you know, that's its niche, whether yeah. you agree with it or not. But in terms of the embodied carbon, yeah, the, the, you know, under lifetime carbon accounting, yeah, my, under, my, my understanding is as well that these, you know, some of those um, poly petrochemical foams do have a high upfront lifetime emissions for sure. Yeah. 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 Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks. Son. Here is Mark. Are you here? Uh, yes, Mark is here too. Yeah. Hi, I'm here. Yeah. Uh, uh, my, sorry, my question was answered earlier. Oh, oh yes, that's right. Yes. Oh. oh, that's right. Okay. Just, just on that, would you have any recommendation on um, how to close the cavity at the top? Where it's quite irregular. And I closed it at closes. the bottom. I was thinking of closing it at the bottom, actually. Um, uh, and well, yes, and the top. 
because okay. the, the the air passage is cold air from the attic coming through into the house through the first floor joist and possibly is it a solid floor did you say or a suspended floor it's solid solid floor so air leakage is likely to find its way in from the attic down the cavity in through the loose joist sockets of the first floor um and of course cold air is scouring heat so your external wall insulation is being bypassed by cold attic air uh, and also air paths probably exist a lot of them into the bottom of the cavity and so that basically you've got a cold you've got a tunnel haven't you between the sort of ground and the sure. cracks and fissures there up the attic so yeah i guess you'd need to cover the close the top and the bottom or fill the entire thing and i sure. thought i don't know tim how much how, how expensive you found the poly bead installation but you would have thought putting in just filling the whole cavity with polybead would be the best approach rather than mucking about with a bit of foam trying to be clever sealing the bottom and then the top do you think yeah definitely yeah yeah and then and that bead would be sufficient to seal it at the, the top and the bottom well we've you know i think there are other factors but but um when a few years ago you know on that project i mentioned a, a little village in herefordshire we did choose polyurethane foam injection to get a much better result for the cavity, but also to try to reduce air leakage. Um, but I think what we might be seeing is that even putting in a blown material like a mineral fibre or a polybead creates enough air resistance to be useful. Okay. All right. Thank you very so much. I'd, I'd risk it. Yeah, I think so. And, and the nice thing about polybead, of course, is that it is vapor open. And if you do have any sort of, you know, moisture spots down for a close of a sort of failed um, DPC, you have got a drying path following the vapor pressure gradient through the polystyrene beads and back into the house. I don't know what the external wall insulation is you're thinking of putting on. EPS was what I'd had quoted. EPS. So so it's not closed cell, but it's it's fairly thick. So the vapor resistance will be quite high on the outside. So poly B does allow some water vapor to maybe find its way back into the house, which which can reduce risk. All right, fantastic. Thanks, Mark. Um, so Benny, if you are still on and would like to ask your question, um, I'll give you one more chance. Otherwise, okay. We'll, yeah, okay, great. Hi, sorry, I was just yeah. on an emergency call there. So no worries. It wasn't working. Not at uh, all. Great, great presentation, guys. I've been following you all for years. Know Dara and Hugh very well. We've done bits and pieces of work together in the past. Andy, you've inspired me for years. I've been plagiarizing your work off your website. And Excellent. Bring it over Excellent. To <laughs> so my, my quick question there really was, did, we, did you compare what a kind of a, your average normal rubbish retrofit would have been, I'll use that term now live, um, to what the cost of that, that one was? Because I found that amazing now to put a timber structure outside of a, of a, of a, of a, 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 a masonry structure. I've never seen anything like that before. And I'm kind of a little bit involved in <clears throat> some of the retrofitting in Ireland. And I think we yeah. should be doing retrofit before a new build. And I think the trades yeah. are going to start fighting for that because there's yeah. not going to be enough to do retrofit and then new build. I think we should do